Uh, thanks again, Amy. Um, my disclosures, uh, as uh, described earlier. Um, Sean has already mentioned Lazarus, but he's stolen my thunder already. Um, but these sorts of saves obviously are kind of you know, catnip for the media because uh, this is uh, an example of that. This is an early uh, ECMO CPR patient from... I was going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is in Australian, the this, this St Vincent's local paper. Um, and uh, this is uh, an example of an early, early survivor of, of uh, ECMO CPR. And these sorts of stories, you know, the, the media love them. But so what I want to actually do today is give you sort of an overview of where we really are at in terms of what the reality of ECMO CPR is and what we can realistically uh, deliver to our patients. So uh, no surprise really, cardiac arrest is, is a pretty lethal condition. Um, this is what happens with uh, the duration of cardiac arrest for out-of-hospital cardiac, out cardiac arrests. Um, uh, this is a study out of Canada and looking at survival versus time. So the longer you, that you're in refractory cardiac arrest for, the, the lower your chance of, of uh, surviving it are. So at around about the 15 minute mark, your chance of surviving um, from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, if you present an, an, um, a non-shockable rhythm, becomes less than 1% at about 15 minutes. And for patients with a shockable rhythm, it becomes less than 1% at about the 48 minute mark. So this is really the kind of the ECMO CPR territory out here because by the time you get the patient into the uh, hospital uh, on the Lucas device or whatever and get cannulated and, ha and get through this low flow state here, uh, it's very hard to do that within, within an hour for out of hospital cardiac arrest. So this, this is the cohort of patients we're interested in trying to, to save with our ECMO CPR program. Uh, so we um, just recently, um, Peter McCanny and and um, and um, Mark Dennis from Prince Alfred Hospital looked at our retrospective experience with ECMO CPR before we started the two chair trial, and we we had been doing this for a few years, uh, roughly five years or so before the, this this trial, and um, we collected 37 patients between the two hospitals, and. Um, fairly evenly divided between out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and in-hospital cardiac arrest and our overall survival was uh, 33 uh, percent um, uh, but reassuringly all the survivors of this program were had good neurological recovery so we had no refractory uh, or severe neurologically impaired uh, survivors from uh, our, our early experience and probably this is largely due to the fact that these patients have gone on fairly quickly so the Median low flow duration was 53 minutes up to between 30 minutes and 70 minutes. So it's a pretty quick establishment of, of uh, ECMO CPR and pretty good survival um, because of that. So how does this stack up compared to the uh, international experience? Uh, these are most of the bigger case series that have been done over the past decade or so. Looking at uh, survival versus median duration of, of uh, cardiac arrest. And you can see that clearly there's a cluster below about the 60 minute mark where survival hovers around sort of 30% to 54% from the, the original chair trial in Melbourne, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail later. But the longer it takes to get the patient onto ECMO, the, the worse the outcomes. And this should be no surprise, but I think probably the most important of these papers is really this one over here from Paris. This is a good, well-designed trial for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest cases um, using uh, manual chest compression to their, their uh, emergency department in a high volume center. And uh, the median time to get on to ECMO support was two hours. They had 51 patients and two of them survived. So 4% survival, very tough trial to, to, uh, to, to perform, but very, very useful information because it suggests that there's actually a hard limit as to how long we can wait or how long we can uh, support these patients for before it becomes futile. Now, having said that, there are those patients that have signs of uh, responsiveness um, during CPR that are, are cases you really probably should keep going on. If the patient's showing signs of life while they're on CPR, on mechanical CPR, uh, or they've got a very high entitled CO2, which is, again is a very good marker of adequacy of, of, um, of uh, CPR, it probably is worth persisting in selected patients. But overall, uh, two hours is, is uh, really a no-go if you can't get them on before that period of time. 
So I should also, to be fair, point out that there are no uh, controlled trials of ECMO CPR versus uh, conventional CPR for re refractory cardiac arrest. Um, so we really don't know what the impact on survival is, but we do know from, from the earlier studies that the survival from refractory cardiac arrest in our group of patients that we'd normally consider for ECMO CPR is pretty dismal. So I think it's pretty fair to say that it's most likely probably a 20 or 30% absolute improvement in survival, but there are no head-to-head -head trials to actually demonstrate that. So how big is the pool of patients that we're likely to uh, employ this mode of support on? Well, reassuringly, ECMO CPR really only applies to, or really only should apply to a fairly small percentage of the total cardiac arrest population. Now, this is another big trial out of Canada where it's just recently been published where they looked at patients who would potentially be eligible for ECMO CPR support. So 11,000 out of hospital cardiac arrest cases. And when you looked at the criteria that we considered to be reasonable for considering patients for ECMO CPR, so younger patients, witness cardiac arrest, not asystolic, CPR within 10 minutes, you automatically drop almost 90% of your patients. So if you then look at that, that group of patients that does not have return of circulation within 20 minutes, which again should be the time we, we're calling for ECMO CPR support, only about 4% of patients do not get return of circulation within 20 minutes. And so this 4% of patients are, are, is a group of patients that you should consider or would be considered for uh, ECMO CPR support. So only a, f a small proportion of the total cardiac arrest population uh, would be eligible, which is good. Uh, this kind of also reflects our own experience. This is uh, our, our screening log for the first uh, three months of this year, uh, looking at uh, potential two-chair trial patients in Sydney. Uh, Lucas CPR cases uh, in the CBD, 146 patients, age less than 70. Uh, you drop almost half of the patients immediately. Initial rhythm is shockable, 17 patients. Uh, arrival in ED within 40 minutes, um, which means that they're potentially um, uh, on ECMO, oops, um, on ECMO within the 60 minute sort of uh, window, um, around 3% of the total. And if you assume that the survival rate is going to be about th a third of patients, the overall um, survival or potential survivors is about 1% of the total uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest population. So um, case selection is very, very important, but also uh, there's actually not a massive burden of patients out there that we're not currently seeing. This, this is, is, uh, is, is about the size of it. Now, a few years ago, um, this is what performing ECMO CPR used to look like uh, in Prince Alfred Hospital um, until uh, Sean came along and, and tidied it all up. I'll talk about uh, later, but clearly one of the big things that uh, improved this whole process was the advent of mechanical CPR. This is the autopulse device over here, which we're not going to talk about, the Lucas device, which we love. Um, and uh, this must be the earlier generation, actually. Um, and uh, these devices have been enormously uh, useful for our ECMO CPR program, not so much because they've been shown to improve survival, because uh, if you're comparing these devices with conventional CPR, they have not been shown to improve survival compared with conventional CPR, but what they do do is make patients easily transportable to hospitals it means it's possible to provide high quality cardiac uh, CPR while you're transferring patients from the field uh, to the emergency department. And uh, it makes the whole process of um, the provision of uh, CPR um, very much uh, simpler and it de-stresses the whole, whole uh, process as we've demonstrated this morning. It becomes just another surgical procedure. Um, and uh, they've been a massive boon for the program. I want to talk a little bit about the original CHAIR trial from Melbourne. And CHAIR stands for, as you heard earlier, me uh, mechanical CPR, uh, hypothermia, um, VA ECMO, and early revascularization. And uh, what um, they found in this trial was that they had um, a combination of um, a fairly young pop patient population with a mean age of 54. Um, uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest criteria that I mentioned already. Um, and so these are the standard sort of accepted criteria for uh, eCPR. And um, yeah, so mean age of 52, uh, two thirds, roughly two thirds in hospital cardiac arrest, one third out of hospital cardiac arrest, 
Fairly quick time to cannulation, so the low flow times were a median of 56 minutes out to about 80 minutes, so pretty quick uh, cannulation. And um, overall survival was 54%, uh, which is really quite a spectacular result and by far the highest recorded uh, survival for this patient population uh, to, to date. Um, so I spoke to the Alfred guys and saying, look, you know, uh, what's, are you guys still getting the same results as this? And they said, well, no, because what actually happened was after this trial, they had a whole year without having a single survivor from the ECMO CPR program. So their survival has dropped back to around about 35%. So uh, I think this was probably a slightly aberrant result, may, may have had two or three more survivors than would have been predicted. And uh, their, their overall survival is about a third of patients in line with what we're seeing uh, our, our local experience. So anything uh, Melbourne can do, um, Sydney can um, hopefully do as well. Uh, so, so to that end, we set up the uh, two-chair trial to really try to replicate the um, Melbourne protocol and see whether we get the same sort of results. Um, around the same time that we're doing this, there are a couple of big papers that came out that, that uh, questioned the role of therapeutic hypothermia as part of refractory cardiac arrest. And um, just briefly, We've scratched out the hypothermic component of the uh, CHAIR protocol because of a couple of papers. One that showed that calling patients after they've had a cardiac arrest and been resuscitated uh, did not improve outcome. And secondly, even uh, more recently, Stephen Bernard, who was one of the, the second author of the original CHAIR trial, did a trial from Melbourne that looked at intra-arrest cooling in patients with refractory cardiac arrest and found that uh, in a big series of 1,200 out-of-hospital cardiac arrest cases, they actually had a lower return of spontaneous circulation in patients that were managed with therapeutic hypothermia, so getting two litres of ice-cold saline while they're arrested, and uh, also found there was absolutely no difference in survival with uh, therapeutic hypothermia given or commenced while the patient's actually arrested. So effectively, therapeutic hypothermia is, is uh, dead in the water. It's, uh, completely finished from the, uh, or sh should be abandoned as part of the cardiac arrest um, uh, protocols um, from, the, the, from these studies. So um, the uh, two-chair trial uh, was another uh, a collaboration between St Vincent's Hospital, Prince Alfred Hospital and the New South Wales Ambulance Service. Um, Quite a difficult process to do because it involved changing the uh, ambulance paramedic protocols for the management of, of out of hospital cardiac arrest. So there's no longer a 20 minute period of staying and playing in the field while, while patients were being, uh, while resuscitation was, was ongoing. The, pa the patients were moved as soon as they, uh, to, as soon as the Lucas device was fitted, the patients were, were moved to Prince Alfred Hospital or to St Vincent's Hospital. Um, it took a lot of coordination and it takes a lot of coordination between the ambulance service, the receiving ED, uh, cardiology, cath labs, the, um, the cannulating teams in, within the hospital and at the moment it's fair to say that this is really pretty much still pretty much a working hours um, program only. So one of the real frustrations of this program at the moment is that we can't really reliably provide a 24 hour service and that's because we don't have experienced cannulators in hospital 24 hours a day. We don't have, um, unlike the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, have uh, intensivists uh, in hospital 24 hours a day. And so the, the two-chair trial was really a very pragmatic trial just to demonstrate whether or not we can get good results uh, using the best people available in hours while everybody's around, while all the processes can be worked smoothly. Um, we have done a few cases out of hours and we do them on an ad hoc basis depending on who is available. Uh, so we do a bit of a call around, but um, if you bring a patient to the hospital um, at midnight or on a, on a Wednesday night or whatever, um, sometimes we just we cannot uh, offer them ECMO support and that's uh, I think the way it's going to be until we sort out whether the results of this trial um, make it worthwhile trying to make it a 24-7 service, which we'd ultimately like to do. Now, Sean, I think has been doing some brilliant work uh, teaching all these sorts of pathway, all these, um, uh, the, the therapeutic pathway involved with getting patients on ECMO CPR um, efficiently. And he's come and ran these simulation sessions uh, at Prince Alfred Hospital. And uh, I think that 
because we, we are looking at different teams of people interacting, uh, ED teams don't normally work with cardiac surgical teams, um, cardiac anaesthetic consultants don't normally spend any time in ED anymore. Um, so there is a lot of teamwork involved with actually making these cases run smoothly and uh, through Sean's efforts um, and uh, Claire Richmond's efforts at Prince Alfred we're getting to the stage now where it's becoming more and more, well, not quite routine but much more, uh, much less exceptional than it used to be and uh, much more part of the normal process that happens with patients that um, we, uh, we would like to resuscitate. So we're about, uh, currently we're about uh, 21 cases into the two-tier trial. These are our results from up until June uh, 2017. At that stage we had 17 patients, we're now at 21. Um, mean age 52, which is where we like to, to pitch these, these patients. Um, I think that's pretty much the, the uh, internationally it's where these patients are, are being mostly, um, the age range are mostly uh, being done at. Uh, predominance of males, uh, in-hospital cardiac arrest survivors and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest survivors, surprisingly similar uh, outcomes with these small numbers so far. So I would have thought that in-hospital survival would be better, but um, out-of-hospital survivors, 3 from 6 and 7 from 17, or 41% at the moment. And as I said, we're around uh, 21 cases now and those figures are holding up pretty well. So I think we're on track after 25 cases to have roughly 35%, uh, 40% survival for the trial overall. So I think that's actually very respectable. respectable. Um, but again, encouragingly, we haven't had um, severely neurologically disabled um, uh, patients as a result of this trial. And uh, we've also had a few patients, a few non-survivors that have gone on to become organ donors, which I think is actually a very useful um, flow-on effect of this program. If, if you don't survive, you may well have usable kidneys and if the families are often quite happy to uh, entertain or consider organ donation uh, in this patient population and we would not otherwise have access to that, that pool of organs uh, without uh, an ECMO CPR program. One of the real challenges moving forward is going to be how to actually make this accessible to as many people as possible. Um, it's never going to be I think something that we can really roll out to the regions very well um, unless technology changes in the future. So it's really going to be a big city or a city-based um, service, which uh, does, you know, it does mean that, that some patients are going to have access to it that others won't. Um, one way to improve access, or one, op one approach to improving access is to do out-of-hospital ECMO CPR. Uh, now this is something that's, as Sean was saying, is being uh, embraced by the French in a much more aggressive way than, than, than uh, almost anybody else. Although there are trials underway also in London and in Prague at the moment of out of hospital ECMO CPR. In fact, the Prague trial has just enrolled its 100th patient, I believe. I don't know what the results are like. Um, but you know, you've got to really be pretty confident. I think that this is, this is the, the floor of the Louvre. Uh, and this is you know, pretty much a very viral you know, kind of a, a photograph in the ECMO community because everybody's just looking at this and thinking, you know, this is unbelievable, but um, they did it. Yeah, yeah, and also one of the, um, uh, the uh, senior intensivists, Alan Coombs from La Pitié in Paris, was actually quite critical of this, this, this particular case because he said the patient could have got to uh, their hospital with, within, um, within about an hour or so. so there is a bit of tension, I think, um, in the ECMO community as, as to whether this is the right approach or not. We do need more data on this. Um, this is another patient in Paris being lifted out of a, an apartment window where they couldn't get, get the patient down the stairs. Uh, and uh, this apartment happened to be uh, here. <laughs> so, so, you know, this is pretty hardcore. So this patient's up there. Uh, Arc de Triomphe is over there. Uh, you can imagine how hard it is getting, this probably doesn't have an elevator inside this building, but they, they, uh, the French you know, never say die. Um, and um, they are providing us with some very useful data on uh, ECMO CPR. Uh, the, the, uh, cardiac arrest happened near National Monuments. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it's very stressful living there. Um, so this guy, Lionel uh, Lameau, who's a French uh, anesthesiologist, um, has presented their preliminary data on out-of-hospital CPR. And what they did was they looked at 42 ECMO CPR patients um, who'd 
been arrested for more than 20 minutes. So they didn't actually make the decision to call for ECMO until the patient had already been arrested for 20 minutes, which I, I think is something that we would probably not do here if we could avoid it. Uh, again, men age 54, uh, uh, fulfilled the usual criteria for ECMO CPR, but included entitled CO2. And I think this is something we should actually probably be putting in our own algorithms. So an entitled CO2 of more than uh, 10 millimeters of mercury is a quite a predictive marker of survival for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And in fact, after 20 minutes, perhaps 14 millimeters of mercury is actually a better marker because there's recent evidence to suggest that uh, with prolonged cardiac arrest, a higher end tidal CO2 is more predictive. So we still have some room to move in terms of getting the, the indications exactly right for these cases. What they did was that in these 42 cases, they decided to put the patient on ECMO in the field uh, if they're more than 10 minutes from the hospital, and that was just under half of the patients, or 18 patients in the series. Uh, the time to establish ECMO was not particularly fast, uh, 71 minutes. We would like to see that under an hour if in, in, in um, our ECMO CPR program. Um, and again, around about a third of patients survived with good neurological outcomes. So this is actually a pretty good survival rate for patients that have been managed exclusively uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest groups. So pretty respectable survival. Um, what they found though is that the signs of life at the time, at the time of the decision to perform ECMO CPR was the single best predictor. So if the patient was trying to fight you or, or pull their arms out or pull a tube out while they're on a Lucas device, they're going to tend to do well. Uh, if they look dead, they probably are. So to really conclude then, I guess reassuringly ECMO CPR is really only for a small minority of ECMO I was out of, sorry, a small minority of cardiac arrest cases, probably around 3 or 4% at best. Um, the key determinants of survival are that whole uh, chain of, you know, early effective CPR, uh, as low a downtime or low, as, long, as low a um, no flow or low flow state as possible before ECMO is established. Um, if the patient can be got on ECMO at around about the one hour arrest time, the survival is pretty good and the neurological outcomes are pretty good. About a third of patients will walk out of hospital, which is probably about a third um, more than would do otherwise. Um, the challenges are gonna be that if we do try to roll this out more broadly throughout, uh, throughout Sydney or perhaps some of the smaller cities throughout the state, uh, what the cost or resource implications of that might be. Uh, I think pretty much, you know, this is about actually our first uh, to a chair trial patient. This is a woman who uh, had an out of hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, she's brought to hospital uh, on a Lucas device, had return of circulation in ED, then re arrested and was massaged back to, massaged up to the cath lab, um, was put on ECMO while she was getting um, her, her uh, right coronary artery uh, uh, opened. Um, she was only on ECMO for about a day and um, uh, left hospital about nine days later with, with good cardiac function and uh, very, very grateful to the paramedics who, who pulled her out of this uh, tight spot. But as I said, the, the, the uh, media do love this stuff. But it is important, I think, that we actually temper their expectations that we, and that we don't oversell this because it is pretty niche. Um, it is going to make dramatic differences to some patients' lives, but not for, not for all of them. Having said that, I think, you know, when in doubt, just call for ECMO. Uh, thanks very much.